Of course, the just blow up the demonic portal plan didn't work. But, you know, it might have. And it would have been really silly not to check. So, after establishing that all we'd managed to do was severely damage the shrine surrounding the Cogden's crater and scare the shit out of a bunch of tech acolytes working on the bridge lift, we moved on to our next low-effort solution. We took one of our three spare pieces of psi shielding, crammed it into the doorway to the tainted cell, and then slapped a few dozen prayer seals on it. When that didn't work, we added the other two pieces of shielding, and when that didn't work, we finally allowed Fumbles to take a look. That was a nervous ten minutes, let me tell you. Despite our very well-founded concerns, letting the accident-prone Psyker poke at the demonic warp portal worked out fine, mostly because the Psy Suppressors kept him from doing anything when he eventually spazzed out. Afterwards, once Fumbles had been woken up, and Twitch had stopped abjuring him and throwing holy water around, the Psyker blearily reported that nothing we were doing actually had any effect on the flow of demonic energy between the Tainted Cell and the Demonthrope. However, he was reasonably sure that increasing the distance between the two would at least reduce the flow a little bit. Since moving the warp portal wasn't an option, the only way to accomplish this was by moving the Demonthrope, plus the various pieces of technology which kept it from killing us all. The task of figuring out how to more or less relocate the entirety of the cells fell to Tink, who immediately declared it to be impossible. This didn't stop him from calling a council of the nerds, including old Bill and Hannah, to figure out exactly how impossible it was, though. Tank and his little think tank quickly established that the only system in the cells that could be easily moved was the psi suppressor. This was primarily because they'd stopped bothering to bolt the suppressors back down between maintenance cycles, so they were all just taped to the floors and walls. On the other hand, the psi shielding and warp presence shroud, which Fumbles said were hiding the Demonthrope's location from its ghost nids, were pretty much built into the structure of the cells. Just removing them would require days of cutting, during which the ghost nids would probably swarm the cells. Finally, the stasis unit restraining the Demonthrope was not designed to be moved. Jostling the focus array could cause problems ranging from flickers to spontaneous bisection of anything inside the stasis field. And power efficiency hadn't even been considered in its design, so running it off a battery was going to be tricky. The first problem to be solved was the stasis field. Tink and Theo realized that they didn't have to fix everything wrong with the Demanthrope stasis unit, since they had a much better one sitting nearly finished, just a few rooms away. Their decision to repurpose Gravis's stasis unit almost got the two of them stabbed by an enraged medic, but luckily they were able to propose a solution for keeping Gravis alive as well. Tink explained from behind an overturned table that there was no reason that the nearly dead space marine couldn't just be thrown into the Demonthrope stasis unit after the bug had been relocated. Doc had not been happy with leaving his patient, even in stasis, next to a demonically tainted hole in reality, but eventually agreed and allowed Tink to flee the medbay. The psi shielding and shroud were much trickier problems and a fair bit of time was spent lamenting that the whole mess at the station had ruined our originally plans to requisition enough materials to completely rebuild the cells. After a few hours of trying to figure out how to pull everything out and set it back up before a tide of ghost nids killed everyone, the ludicrous proposal of cutting a massive hole through the ship and moving the cells, minus the warpy bit, as one big ol' thingy was put forward. Luckily, old Bill saved us from that retarded plan when he decided to take a second look at the list of parts that had need to be moved. 
consummate scrounger that he was, old Bill could typically suggest five different alternatives for any missing critical part. And he was better than a savant when it came to keeping track of what had been used where, and whether it would be missed. His abilities had let him down a little bit when it came to the highly specialized systems in the cells, but they came to our rescue in a big way when he asked whether the psi shield panel was anything like a psi focusing panel. After some debate, Tink pointed out that it was all moot, since there weren't any psi focusing panels in the inventory. Old Bill asked whether anyone thought our headless astropath still needed the ones lining his sanctum. One quick check of the dried, brain-splattered sanctum later, it was established that the panels which focused incoming astropathic messages on the chair in the middle of the sanctum could indeed be repurposed as shields. Theo, who'd become the resident expert on the underlying theory of most of the systems in the cells, claimed it was just a matter of tweaking the machinery that aligned the crystal matrices in each panel, and began estimating how long it would take to move them all the to the bay that had been picked for the new cells. Tink asked why the hell we should bother moving them. The decision to just repurpose the Occurrence Border's bridge-adjacent astropathic sanctum as a demonthrope holding area was reached quickly by Tink and his fellow nerds. It took a little more time and a lot more shouting for Sarge, the captain, and the navigator, whose sanctum was next door, to come around. And that time was used to tackle the final problem, the Warp Presence Shroud. The Shroud was a device which hid the Warp Presence of anyone inside from those outside. Such devices were typically used to hide vulnerable psychers from hungry demons during warp travel, but they were also great for hiding from other psychers. Since the occurrence border had been smuggling child psychers, a practice which the Inquisition sort of frowned upon, the cells were a very good shroud. Though it hadn't done jack to hide the zoanthrope from the demon that had been lurking inside its radius. Anyway, this well-made shroud consisted of a fair-sized pile of arcane machinery, which was unfortunately hooked to some sort of projector matrix embedded in the psi shields. Once again, it seemed like days of disassembling while fighting off a ghost nid onslaught would be needed, but Theo had a better idea. The little Tau scientist claimed that the block of wraithbone he'd been playing with for the last few weeks had some interesting anti-warp properties, and he was 72.361% sure that it could be used to build something that would work like a shroud. It was a mark of everyone's exhaustion that the annoying little Xenos' idea was accepted without argument. So, roughly 26 sleepless hours after our discovery of the Zoanthrope's wings, we designed a new cell to contain it, 30 hours of hard work and heroic ghost tyranid killing after that, the new cell was complete, and all that was left to do was transport the barely restrained Xenos demon host through a ship full of the ravenous insectoid warp ghosts it had called into existence. When Tink said everything was ready, all of us plus Theo and Gravis' mobile medical monstrosity gathered in the cells. During the prior few days, we'd managed to hold off the ghost nids and keep the space marine alive, despite a steady increase in the demonthrope's power over the ship and the irreparable failure of one of the psi suppressors. During the little free time we'd had, a route had been plotted from the cells up through the lower decks to the bridge lift, and finally to the sanctum. The corridors were cleared of impediments. All the armsmen that could be spared from the main lines were stationed at checkpoints along the route, and the new stasis unit had been mounted on a motorized cargo pallet. When the last of the preparations were finished, Sarge alerted the captain, who sent out a ship-wide warning, and we got ready for the most hectic prisoner transfer of our lives. The first step of transfer was moving the Demonthrope from its old stasis unit up to the new mobile ones. 
There was probably a whole chapter on this sort of thing in whatever the inquisitorial equivalent of the uplifting primer is. You're probably supposed to use all sorts of seals, powerful psychers, and some of that special tyranid tranquilizer the scythes had. We made do, with a few ropes, a ramp made out of a wall panel that no one would miss, and a cargo net. Tink lined up his long-distance manipulation tool, see poking stick, on the stasis unit's off button, then jabbed it and dove for cover. As the stasis field disappeared, a pair of deep red spots appeared on the Demonthrope's metal-covered face, and its stubby little smoke wings suddenly expanded to a full meter in length. A horrible, soundless screech echoed through the cells, Thousands of insects began pouring out of every crack and crevice, and a corona of black-edged green lightning formed around the demonthrope. Then the cargo net yanked off its grav plates and dragged it face-first down the corrugated metal ramp. The demonthrope flailed around a little, but didn't have enough strength to offset the manly and womanly muscle of four guardsmen. We dragged it, screeching and kicking up sparks into the waiting stasis unit, and Theo turned on the stasis field. The insects around the room vanished in little puffs of black and green smoke, but a faint echo of the psychic screeching lingered, and the spots where the Demonthrope's expanded wings met the edge of the stasis field smoked in an ominous way. Sarge decided that this shit was too eldritch for his liking, yelled at Tink, Theo, and Doc to move their asses. Doc was in a bit of a panic on account of how insects had been crawling out of Gravis's torso wound during the Demonthrope transfer, and the fact that every life support system hooked to the Marine was screaming for attention. He dithered around, trying to figure out what to treat first, until Sarge resolved things by hefting Gravis off his life support bed, Doc tried and failed to keep everything connected as the torsofied space marine was hauled across the room, then just gave up and helped Sarge. Gravis started to spasm and spurt all sorts of disgusting fluids as he was pushed into the bubble of an old G in the middle of the stasis unit, prompting Doc to panic and hit the on button a little early. He apologized profusely as he bandaged Sarge's slightly shorter finger, and sprayed disinfectant over everything Gravis had dribbled on. While Gravis was moved, Tink and Theo ran around directing us and their drones in the process of moving the psi suppressors. Extensions were spliced into the power cords of each of the hacked-together Tau Imperial hybrid devices, and a jumbled circle of arcane machinery was formed around the Demonthrope's stasis pallet. Then, piece by piece, each of the psi suppressors was fastened to the pallet until it bristled with various engines, antennae, crystals, and less identifiable pieces of tech. When all the suppressors were fastened down and connected to the large battery array mounted on the front of the pallet, and Gravis was safe-ish in the Demanthrope's old stasis unit, we were pretty sure that his expression of pain and horror wasn't anything to worry about. We readied our weapon and got everything ready for the hard part. Sarge sent a final warning to the captain and counted down. As Sarge reached zero, Spot 2.0 opened the outer door to the cells, and all across the ship, the Tyranid warp ghosts paused in their pursuit of repositioning armsmen, turned to focus on us, and solidified. <laughs>